Dirk. I'm coming from Berlin. I'm uh, part of uh, what is called the Crypto Economics Consulting Group uh, in Berlin, which is um, what well, I call it a cypherpunk and crypto anarchist disorganization. Um, yeah, we will never incorporate and never turn into an official organization, I guess, in the state uh, of uh, affairs right now. And um, what we are focusing on and aiming to uh, is to promote and create projects uh, that fulfill something that we call bringing Bitcoin on the road. Projects that I'm involved in uh, in these regards, and then I would like to shine a light on why am I doing this, and uh, then I would like to talk about why am I really doing this. Um, so these bringing Bitcoin to the road projects uh, for this, I, I have a thesis, I have a theory, and uh, the theory is something turns into money when people can buy food with it and can support their relatives overseas. It does not turn into money when financial regulators define it as money, and it does not turn into money when financial investors get interested in it. It turns into money when normal, actual people uh, are able to use it as such. And um, to allow people um, who are not cypherpunks, crypto nerds, hackers, civil rights fighters, financial experts, and all these sorts of uh, people, just normal people, my mom and your moms, um, to give them um, a chance to learn about Bitcoin and to make their own first-hand experiences using Bitcoin. Um, yeah, I'm involved in two projects. One of the two many of you may have heard of, that is the so-called Bitcoin Keats in Berlin. Um, the Bitcoin Keats is supposedly uh, the area worldwide with the most, the highest density of bricks and mortar businesses. Um, I have to say that the media have, of course, totally exaggerated what is going on there. If you see some reports somewhere, you get the feeling that nobody in Kreuzberg is using anything else but Bitcoin anymore. That is, of course, not true. Um, but it shows uh, that we're having a good public relation uh, department there going on. So what's happening, we, have, we are maybe having a bit more than two dozen retail shops, bars, restaurants there right now that officially and all the time uh, accept Bitcoin. That, thank you very much. Um, that have a sticker on the door that says Bitcoin accepted here, Bitcoin Keats, and we have maybe another two dozen uh, shops, retailers, bars, restaurants that are in the process of learning how to deal with it. We are having, uh, or uh, yeah, economic cycles are actually starting to develop there. For example, I run a bar, Room 77, on this Bitcoin Keats, which is a uh, site business. Um, and I, for example, can use the Bitcoins that we take in already to pay my beer supplier. I can use the Bitcoins I take in to pay the printer who prints our menus, or I can pay this or that employee in Bitcoin. So we have this, what we're actually trying to achieve there is to use Bitcoin as what we call our local alternative currency with global reach. Um, so, I'll, I'll jump into the, the actually second part. No, I don't. Um, hold on, yeah. I just made this, uh, this uh, lecture half an hour ago, so bear with me. Um, anyhow, that's the state of uh, affairs in regards to this Bitcoin Keats. The other project that we just rolled out last week that I would like to introduce, and you're going to hear a lot about it in the next couple of weeks, I guess, is called CryptoCharity.org. Um, we wrote that out last week, and I did that together with um, uh, Alex and Matt from Bitcoin Tablet, and with a Berlin-based um, charity organization called Africa Rice. And what we set up there is, um, well, I would call it crypto economics applied to um, charity organizations. But a normal charity organization, you put your money in somewhere, from that money a Mercedes for the CEO has to be paid, 
paid, a lot of bureaucratic costs have to be paid, um, a huge million uh, euro emotional advertising campaigns have to be paid before Christmas. Um, when you look at these campaigns nowadays, you can actually see that the big charity organizations in their advertising are not even talking about anymore uh, for what they are going to spend that money. They are only trying to tell us we are the ones that you can trust that we give the money to the right people who are in need. Now what crypto charity aims to is, um, yeah, if you think of crowdfunding, we came to the term crowd spending or crowd giving, um, meaning if you want to donate some money because um, you want to help out some people in need, you can go to this platform on which you will find uh, several charity projects um, which you can look at, which you can see if you find this worth supporting and which you can support directly. Um, our first project um, that we stated there is a vocational school in Uganda, um, which is supported by Africa Rise. And um, we already had some Bitcoin tablets, as we call them, down there, um, equipped with solar chargers. So we had already a field test in Uganda where we want to support this vocational school. And the idea basically there is, in the first step, to raise the money for having 15 Android tablets, uh, to raise the money uh, for a proper internet connection for that school, um, and yeah, to have some kind of uh, IT classes that enable people down there uh, to use this information technology and to set up their own crypto charity projects. So in our uh, view, crypto charity should look like someone somewhere in the world is in need because that tsunami hit them or the power plant blew off or there's a war or something like that. Um, we want to deliver these, these tablets down there and we want to enable people to show the world what their situation is. <coughs> You're not giving your money to the Red Cross or to UNICEF. You're giving your money to someone who shows you online, this is me, this is my face, my name, my family, my village, our problem. We need this well or we need these houses or we need this or that. And you can instantly uh, contribute and donate to these people with Bitcoin, you can instantly see that 100% of your donation goes to these people that you chose to support and these people can give the feedback and show you that they used the money for what they said they would need it for. Um, so, if you are... Um, so these are these two projects that I just wanted to shine a light on, um, check them out. Uh, crypto charity is in its very early stages, there's a lot of questions, uh, you might probably have some and I might probably not have the answer yet because I think we opened a field there where we can now start trying different things um, of, with reputation and, and so on. Um, yeah, so I want to move on to why am I doing this? Um, at the beginning I had the thesis that I think something turns into money when people can buy food with it or support their relatives overseas. Um, um, the uh, Bitcoin Keats project, um, for example, um, is very successful in bringing Bitcoin to people who usually would not discover it that early because they're just not interested in, in crypto technology or new cool payment systems or whatever. Um, so but having a bar or a restaurant where people come in, um, you have your regulars and running it like that allows these people to very easily learn about it. Like some regular would come ask, what is this Bitcoin stuff then I hear a lot, a lot about? And uh, you just give them some answer, it's a decentralized free money market, a free market money system. 
I go, like, ah, um, it may take four weeks till they have the next question. It may take another week till they see, read something on the paper. So, but this is the way we drag people in there. Also, um, another reason why we actually started using uh, Bitcoin at Room 77, and this is really absurd now looking back at it over these two and a half years, um, was that back then we realized that all media coverage about uh, Bitcoin um, is usually about uh, buying drugs on Silk Road or money laundering. I come from uh, strategic corporate communication and public relations, so I know how the media work. Um, that means everybody just retypes the article that someone else has written. And um, so we back then realized we need to give the media pictures, we need to give the media something in real life um, so they change uh, their reports about Bitcoin, putting it into these drug buying and uh, money laundering um, corners. And this was very, very successful. From the, from the very first report about um, yeah, this bar in Berlin-Kreuzberg that accepts this funny new currency, um, all these media reports were about how cool and easy it is to pay a dinner with this smartphone thing. Um, the development in these two and a half years is absolutely massive. You have to imagine that two and a half years ago, uh, maybe we had one Bitcoin customer a week and that person usually came in with a laptop and then tried to type those 34 digits into his decline. So um, today, uh, Bitcoin payment there um, goes much faster than probably even cash when you have to give people change. Um, anyhow, very, very, I'm at the uh, part of the uh, talk about why am I doing this. So we realized that, that this way we can create a lot of positive media attention for Bitcoin and the Bitcoiners here uh, in this room probably can confirm that we were successful in that. In those two years we have created far more than 100 million media contacts. That means all over the world, more than 100 million times, someone somewhere read in a newspaper, heard on a radio station, saw on a TV station, that Bitcoin is something um, that you can pay a dinner with, that it's faster and cheaper and better than the usual payment systems we have. Um, one other very important reason why we are doing these projects um, is because we think with, with running this kind of project we can give legitimacy to Bitcoin. Uh, legitimacy in the eyes of people who I described before, my mom and your moms, people who are not digging deep and thinking about how does central banking work and what is inflation and why do I pay 3% here on the credit card or 20% when I send money to Africa. Um, there is a high probability that at a certain stage some governments will start trying to act against Bitcoin. Though they could have, we don't know if it's going to happen, but there is a probability. And um, if they do so, they would probably use two strategies. First is uh, they would criminalize Bitcoin in certain jurisdictions. And the other one is the usual propaganda war that uh, governments are very good at to put something into a dark light. So in case these, this, let me call it war on Bitcoin or, or anti-Bitcoin campaign would start, the more people on the planet have understood that Bitcoin is not an evil thing, um, the more people we will have on our side. Um, if the government starts criminalizing or starts propaganda against some totally abstract virtual technology asset that nobody understands, nobody's going to back it up. If people understand, hey, that's a money that, that is a better money than any we've ever seen, my transactions are cheaper and more reliable, and so on, and I can send money overseas without paying um, Western Union and people like that, these normal people will understand, right, uh, the government is just trying to force us to keep using the old system. 
and then they will back up um, the Bitcoin community. That's what I think. And um, yeah, these are the reasons why we run, why we try to find and, and, and try to develop and try to support these brilliant Bitcoin on the road um, projects. So this was the part, um, why am I doing this? Um, but I would also like to talk about why am I really doing this. Um, bear with me, this is the last talk. Um, when I say why am I really doing this, I will actually talk about what I believe. When I talk about what I believe, I think I'll start with a little history first. Um, some many thousand years ago, people were hunters and gatherers. That means they were strolling the lands, um, trying to catch some fish or rabbit, and trying to find some fruit or vegetable. They were not very successful, their economy was not very efficient. And at a certain, during a certain period of time, people stopped hunting and gathering and strolling the lands and started to settle and build the first villages. Um, this crucial moment in human history has been called the Neolithical um, Revolution. It's uh, funnily enough, it's, it has su supposedly has taken place only over the course of a few hundred years, and after those few hundred years, the world looked totally different to what it looked before. Um, economists call this kind of uh, event that changes things totally an economic singularity. Um, the Neolithical Revolution as an as a economic singularity means that before it had happened, nobody even had a word for house because nobody knew of the concept of a house. Nobody had an idea what a house could be. But when humankind, after humankind had gone through this period of change, we not only had houses, we had architects. Um, we had um, villages. We had uh, split up the production processes, which made us um, much more efficient and much more productive, which allowed us uh, to produce surplus um, products. Um, we had storage facilities. Um, we had a total increase in efficiency and productivity. Um, out of this came art. Before, um, before the Neolithical Revolution there was no art and with this Neolithical Revolution culture developed. So what I'm trying to say is that a economic singularity is a moment in history that you cannot see coming, you cannot realize that it's happening right now, while it's happening. All you can is, after it happened, look back and realize, wow, it has happened. And um, <clears throat> yeah, we're on a Bitcoin conference, so um, here is my belief. I strongly believe, and this is why I'm really doing all this stuff that I'm doing, I strongly believe that with Bitcoin, we have entered a new economic singularity. I strongly believe that um, we, what we see starting to happen here is so much more than the birth of a new payment system or decentralizing a bit here or a bit there or getting cheaper transactions or stuff like that. I strongly believe that by the end of this decade already, um, we will conduct business and uh, carry out transactions in ways and based of mechanisms for which we now don't even have words yet, for we for which we now of which we now don't even have an idea yet, which now not even a science fiction author could describe. Science fiction authors usually take what we have and extrapolate it into the future, so the spaceship goes a bit further into another galaxy instead of the moon or whatever. But not even science fiction authors uh, can come up with visions for 
how we will use this technology and how this technology is going to change the way we organize our lives and, 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 and our interactions. Um, and that is the reason why I'm really doing all um, this stuff and um, that's why I'm so happy to be, to be able to be part of this. This is really the most fascinating and exciting thing that I have seen in my life and four years ago I wouldn't have thought that something like that happens in, uh, in my lifetime. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm going to end here. This is the reason why I'm really doing these things. Um, I uh, yeah, would invite and support everybody to do the same kind of things and I guess this whole room is full of people who are doing this anyhow. I believe, honestly, the rest of this decade will be one hell of a ride. We will not come to any moment of rest or something like that. Um, the growth and, and, and speed of adaption of this technology um, yeah, will be overwhelming to all of us. And um, I'm looking forward to riding this wave with all of you. Thanks. If anyone has any questions, um, feel free or cheers. <laughs> for sharing your thoughts. Um, I wanted to ask uh, what you think um, about what are some, some good strategies you have used to convince businesses, like businesses selling bread and drinks and so on, to actually convince them to use Bitcoin. I mean, there, I guess there are a lot of people here that are local meetups in right. cities that just sort of start now. So what is the, the best way to involve businesses to accept it? Um, well, I can, I can talk about how it happened in Berlin and I would strongly suggest you start with some business in the middle. You need someone who just starts doing it. Um, it took one and a half years uh, between when we first started accepting uh, Bitcoin at our bar till the next three bars joined in. Um, reasons to convince a retailer or bar owner, you have on a very trivial business level you can go um, look, you are uh, able to receive digital transactions without paying 3% to MasterCard. You have that money at your disposal straight away and you're not going to have to worry about chargebacks for the next 180 days. That already makes a hell of a lot of sense for many small businesses who usually work on 5-10% profit. If they save the 3% they pay to MasterCard, um, that's a big issue for them. And of course, then when something like this Bitcoin feeds thing starts to develop, you, you, you get in the network effect. You know, you have a few other businesses that also accept Bitcoin. You have people who visit these businesses. Uh, you convince individuals to start using Bitcoin. Um, and then they go to other places again. Um, and ask them, hey, can I pay in Bitcoin here? Why not? I can pay room 77 around the corner at Devil's Kitchen and I can uh, pay this or that. Um, so I think this is this is the way we have actually. It, it took two and a half years. Uh, now we had a crucial moment that I'm absolutely happy about. Only last week, because um, of course all the other businesses that um, are taking part in the Bitcoin kits were somehow approached by some of us. We have this enabler team at CECG that pro bono for no money visits businesses and uh, shows them, explains them, installs the infrastructure, the software, shows them how to use it and stuff like that. So all the shops so far have been approached by us somehow and last week we had this crucial moment. Some lady running a tea shop 200 meters down the road who I, I have never spoken to, I have never visited her place, I didn't even know who runs this place, turned up at room 77 and as hey, you are these Bitcoin guys, I want to have that too. So, I, I found that for myself. <laughs> <laughs> but that's basically how you can start it. You start uh, meetups, the meetups at, at Room 77 um, are busy. Uh, 
it attracts attention, you get media coverage and so on. This is the way it happened there. May, may I add a similar story? Uh, I think uh, what, what you could sell in your community is what I experienced. I got a, um, a dentist calling me uh, that he would want to accept Bitcoin. I never worked with this dentist, I never know near him. It's a, it's a, it's a big, big practice. But the point is, he, this guy recognized that previously there was a nice article about Bitcoin and lots of people, young people were reading it. And he recognized that by accepting Bitcoin, he will get media coverage. Yeah? So I think it works. And just, just tell them, if you are the first pub, if you are the first dentist accepting Bitcoin in some certain community, you get media coverage. Cheap. I mean, if you imagine, I've mentioned far more than 100 million press contacts for, for our bar. If you, if you were a corporation that wants to pay for that, you know, it's, it's, it's unreal. I, uh, I have a question. So say I didn't want to go to some local businesses in my community. Is there a website I can send them to or some place where I can get information on point of sales, software tools that I can teach them how to use? Like how do you, like you must have some tools that you use in your community. Um, we don't use any tools like BitPay or anything like that. Um, Vitalik has already, um, we will of course use bits of proof soon. <laughs> um, Vitalik has, uh, funnily enough, uh, described that in his last article about the Bitcoin keys. Um, where he said, like, funnily enough, nobody here is using any, any caching service like, like BitPay or something, because that's what we want to do. We want to use Bitcoin at the level of person to person, human to human, customer to... So uh, just using the Android wallet on a yes. cell phone? Yes, we, we, we look at... scan it and take it from there. We look at every in individual infrastructure of every individual business. Have you got an iPad? Have you got an internet? Have you got a Linux machine or whatever? And we show you how to take in the money. Some, print, some have a printed out QR code hanging on the wall and check it on blockchain info if they if the payment went through. Others use, uh, from Andreas Schildbach, who is also part of CECG, the, um, the Android wallet, uh, no, the Bitcoin wallet for Android and, and BlackBerry. So each of these businesses uses something different, but we help them all to, uh, to get started. We have an, a local mailing list where um, users can help users. So one bar owner sends a message to everybody, my coins are not there, my coins are not there. But some other bar owner has already learned about this and goes like, just update your blockchain, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, I cannot name you any website right now. <coughs> no, and I'm um, so much looking forward. Uh, I think that would, that would be legendary if my bar would be subject to the first 50, uh, to the first double spend attack. Um, <laughs> we, accept bit, we accept the payment once it's unconfirmed, broadcasted, which takes like a second. Um, yeah, and I'm looking, I'm hoping we're going to be uh, the first double spend attack business, and I'm that sure that whoever will do it will not be some evil person trying to cheat for his beer or burger. I, I'm definitely sure if we suffer a double spend attack an hour later, some young hackers will be standing at the bar and going like, we were it, we did it, we proved it. So, yeah, no, no problem, in two, in two and a half years, and we said we accept uh, unconfirmed transactions until we run into a problem, we haven't had one. Hi, uh, I was wondering if you talk about how people uh, actually will take the Bitcoins for spending and uh, be going to set up the Bitcoin ATM machines, maybe? I would love to. Yeah, I would love to. Um, also, some people already offered and said, okay, your business uh, is the place where we would like to have one of these machines. I really have to look into what that means legally. For example, if Room77, we do not sell or buy Bitcoins because I want to not endanger this business and the employees there, because maybe if we start buying and selling there, some regulator will at some stage turn around and go like, hey, you should have had a banking license or something. But I'm right now trying to find out what such an ATM machine means uh, legally and if I can set it up or if somebody else has got the proper licensing or whatever, so we could do it in his name. I'd love to have one. Hello, you made a break here. Yeah, you made a very good, uh, interesting historical point about uh, the Neolithic Revolution. 
think maybe Bitcoin is almost a return to the pre-Neolithic because the Neolithic with agriculture we had centralized power whereas before it was sort of tribal, you know, orgiastic apes on the sedan, you know, eating mushrooms and that sort of thing. So maybe Bitcoin is kind of a return to that Eden that was lost as a result of this centralization, hoarding resources and building walls around cities and uh, becoming what we sort of are today with all our problems. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you uh, saw the uh, talk of Johan just uh, before. I think he made some really, really great points and explained it very nicely that we actually, that our natural order is actually decentralized and we just had this big centralizing fuck up in the last few thousand years, uh, which we now need to clean up and which Bitcoin, uh, yeah, gives hope that we uh, will be able to clean it up. There's, there's basically two systems uh, being used uh, by the bars and retailers uh, on, on these Bitcoin keys. One is you just declare the euros that you take in at the end of the night. Like you come to me and you have to pay 20 euros. You would send me Bitcoin, but in the end of the day, I would write into the books 20 euros. Uh, due to the new information from the German government, we now have to look at uh, how long do we have to keep those bitcoins in order not to be subject to taxes on on uh, on thanks on capital gains, um, which we just have to find out. Now another system uh, that is being used is is. Uh, like treating Bitcoin as a foreign currency. You are by uh, law required to accept Euro, but you can also accept any other currency. And um, if you accept another currency, yeah, you can just keep that in your box. We are doing that now because we, because yeah, it's getting more complex. There are suppliers in Bitcoin, the computer store next door takes Bitcoin, so it makes more sense to have this system which is called a foreign currency accounting. So you use both at the same time? No, we just switch from one to the other. I think uh, for lower complex issues like you're a bar and you get a Bitcoin payment every second day or something, the first thing makes more, more sense, but when, you, when it starts getting more complicated, um, paying suppliers and employees and so on, so on, uh, it makes more sense. And uh, cloud price volatility of Bitcoin. Pardon? Uh, cloud price volatility of Bitcoin. Does that uh, sort of concern the, the other, you know, bar people that, you know, like, because you were talking about the 3% that you can offer them immediately for not using the credit card, but at the same time, you know, Bitcoin can go up and down quite a lot more than that. And then when you're, when you have to hold on to it for a while, um, because that's the system you've mentioned, that you have to hang on to it for a while, how does that work? Um, yeah, volatility is still probably the biggest obstacle um, for business owners to, to accept Bitcoin not using a system like BitPay that takes the risk of volatility, uh, volatility out of uh, the system. Um, I personally, or we at Room 77, uh, we, we, we just take on that risk, put it this way, um, and all the others so far have followed this. Um, I have not heard any complaints so far. It might, might, might have something to do with the fact that well, Bitcoin is actually going up, up, up. Yeah, I mean, you, have those, you have those tips. Them, nobody there is unhappy, you know. And uh, especially the people who started using Bitcoin, uh, accepting Bitcoin a year ago, or even half a year ago. Or was it half a year ago? I don't know. They're smiling, you know. They're not. Um, there is nobody who ever turned around and was like, "Hey, Jörg, you sold me this bullshit. I lost money or something." It didn't happen yet. Um, there was this question, how do you get a, a business to start Bitcoin, by the way? We also find some was from you. Um, another idea, 
about that is, of course, if you know the owner of a business and trust him, you leave him an envelope with 200 euros cash. Honestly, you did that? Uh, to someone who was like, yeah, well, what is this? I don't trust it. I'm going to lose money. So we left 200 euros in cash and we're like, look, you're starting to use it now. Here's the 200 euros cash. If you lose any money, um, this is yours. So you, you, you deduct the money that you lost from these 200 euros. If you don't, you give me back the 200 euros in three months. Got the 300 euros back from somebody three months later, smile, with a smile on his face and a big thank you. Also worked. Final question. Yeah, it's me again. I was wondering uh, what uh, you would want to improve about the, the Android wallet that you said you know, Andreas is wallet that people use. Like, you, you've got a lot more practical experience with it than even I have, I guess. So that would be useful to know. Um, you, you're asking what are the next... Like, what, what would you change or improve about the, the smartphone wallet experience? Um, I wouldn't have any now. Um, the... well, none. The improvements no, okay. on the on the Android wallet, on the Bitcoin wallet from Andreas. Yeah. yeah. Uh, couldn't couldn't think of one now. Would have to go with it into depth really. Oh, cool. It, it, it works perfectly for us right now. Thank you. <laughs>